All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. Well, good morning to you. It's still morning, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, Good morning to you. I'm Kim McAllister in for Mark Thompson today. Mark is on his cruise. When I talked to him last night, he was sailing his way to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, and he was still complaining. And I said, here's my tiny violin. I really feel bad that you're going to Cabo. But he's having a good time, kind of. We'll see if he settles in and accepts that he's actually on vacation. I'm hopeful, uh, and I hope that he and Courtney have a great time. But we're keeping the home fires burning here on the Mark Thompson Show. How's it going, Albert? Good morning, Kim. This is your uh, part two for your going solo. I heard you went solo for the Nikki Medora show, too. So. I did, and I was thinking about you because I had Rich Wolkoff on today talking about the 49ers. He says it's bird hunting season. Yeah, we, we've been playing the bird teams. We got the Eagles. We had the Seahawks this week. I think we had the Seahawks this week before that, too. So lots of... Uh, Lots of birds that were playing again. He seemed to think that the 49ers are headed toward the Super Bowl. And they're trending in the right direction, so mm-hmm. I don't like to count my pick well yeah. keep with the bird. <laughs> I don't want to count my pick before they have. So. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, thank you for being here. Please click the like button if you could. That is a Smash free way to help us out. Take your iron rod. Indeed, take your iron rod and just hit it hard. Um, <laughs> we'd also appreciate it if you haven't subscribed, if you could uh, do that as well. Very grateful. It is going to be a great show because Michael Shore will be here to talk politics. And I always enjoy the conversation with uh, with Michael Shore. We will also have Friday Fabulous Florida. John Daly will join us for that. And Albert has put together a great Friday segment. Are you feeling pretty good about it? It was a little hard to sometimes Florida, they're like it's it's insanely wild what they do down there. This week I got a, I had to do a little digging, but there's a there's there's some animal stories in there. I know you love the animal oh, stories. I like so the crocodile yeah, stories, yeah. Yeah. There's a very okay. rare animal story actually. So we'll okay. we'll get to that. Okay, so uh, Friday Fabulous Florida coming up. And then also uh, we'll talk with a culture blaster, Michael Snyder, about his movie reviews. And that will come toward the uh, second part of the show in hour two. Uh, But first, let's talk about some of the things going on in the world. Why don't we? Because the Mark Thompson show. Yeah, something happened in San Francisco and made me sad. And I don't know how many people passed by this house. But it gave me great joy. You know those houses in your community that are totally decked out for the holidays and you cruise by and it's just, you know, sometimes you can see people stopping and pulling over to kind of uh, check everything out and enjoy the moment. One of these homes in San Francisco was kind of like that. And for years I would drive by and just love it. Well, the owner of the house has died and the Christmas display will not be going on this year for this house in San Francisco, but I will show you a picture of what it looked like in years past. And it's pretty over the top. I always thought they must have someone come help them. Uh, You know, like a a team of decorators to, to come help. Here's what it looked like. I mean, just over the top, huge stockings hanging from the second story, huge Christmas tree decorated in the front yard, and so many decorations. You can see people gathered on the street. So it's always sad to see this happen. And these beloved members of the community are no longer with us. So uh, I wanted to mention that if that is a house that you love to look at in San Francisco, that one, uh, it won't be the same anymore. So that's a, a bit of a sad situation. It is, though, the technically first day of Hanukkah, although I know the celebration was last night. Uh, This is the first day of Hanukkah. So happy Hanukkah to you if you celebrate that. I don't know if you heard this story. It's kind of a a soft news story. But Paris Hilton, (laughs) for those that care, is out talking about why she didn't change her son's diapers for the first month of his life. Must be nice to have a nanny. Let's what? just say that. Yes. Now she's got another baby. She had her children via surrogate. So she's got two infants. 
And now she's figuring, okay, I guess I better learn how to change a diaper. The fact that you could go a month without knowing this to me is like foreign la-la land. I don't get that, how this is even possible. But she said, she told her sister, I'm scared. She hasn't personally changed her one month old diaper. She said, I wouldn't do this on my birthday, but I will for you, she told her, her young son, her infant son. And so she got a, a diaper changing lesson from her sister and also her nanny. But this is just a whole nother world to me, how this could even be possible. I, I don't know. It must also, be nice, Kim, not to get your hands dirty. Just uh, I don't yeah. know, because part of being a, a parent is getting in there and getting your hands dirty and doing all those things and being there for this other little person in the world. So I, I guess you can be a parent without, you know, hands on. But I don't think I would have wanted to do that. That it wouldn't have been the same to me. So there maybe there are many people who would say I would love to be a parent if I didn't have to get my my hands dirty and all of this. I yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't appeal to me at all. It seems kind of on brand for her character. But that, that I felt like she her character has developed over the years. It's not like the same two mm thousands -hmm. Paris Hilton that we remember. But yeah, this kind of remi reminded me of that. Well, I'm looking at this story uh, from the Huffington Post today, and I mentioned it earlier on Nikki Medora's show with John Rothman, but Republican senators are believing that the cake is baked and that Trump is a lock for the 2024 nomination. There's never been Mitt anything like this. Sadly, true. Uh, Mitt Romney saying it was over before it even began. Uh, the, hardly anybody watched the fourth presidential primary GOP presidential primary debate. And now I understand that CNN and ABC want to have two more. I don't think we need these. I mean, I don't want to say that it's I, I would I would like to come from the perspective that it's it's always good to put more information out into the world, right? To have people understand have a more clear understanding of the candidates and who's running. But I think we kind of get it at this point. And the last couple of debates have been nothing but really chaos, where I don't know if we learned anything important about any of the candidates, really. So a lot of recycled material, all the stuff we know, and everyone just trying to gang up on Trump because they all are afraid that he's actually going to, you know, so. Yeah. The cake Two more is of them, though. It's easy content. Do we need Back it? When, I was, uh, when I was at KGL, easy, I was like, oh, yeah, this is content. easy. This is easy content for us. <laughs> it's <laughs> true. Clips. Yeah, but boring. And who's going to watch it? I don't know. We'll be talking about it here just because it's news. But um, Senator Lindsey Graham saying, and of course, he's a, a Trump ally, saying the cake is baked. Uh, and also, there's a Republican senator, a first term senator from Missouri. His name is Eric Schmidt, who's saying, I think this is over. Now, granted, these are all Trump backers and anything is possible right? We don't know what's going to happen with the legal cases pending against Trump. We don't know what's going to happen with anybody's health. There's so, there's question marks all over the place. But it does seem like with Trump so far ahead of the, in the polls, it looks like he's the nominee. And every step he takes closer to becoming president again is kind of a step closer that I take to having more and more fear in my heart. So I, I don't know. But we'll get some more debates. Uh, the ABC and CNN debates uh, set to come, I think, in January. And they're going to, what's interesting, it's almost like they're competing for the attention on this. They're going to do them from the same state and only two days apart. So that's kind of a, a weird situation. I don't know. Um, okay. You know, you know what else I wanted to ask you? Also, um, Albert, is about the Warriors, because I was talking to Rich Walkoff about the Warriors as well, not to circle back to sports, um, but he was talking about the game. I think there's a game tonight, a Warriors game. Are you still following Warriors closely or because they're not headed to playoffs, it doesn't seem, have you backed off? Well, it's early in the season, and mm -hmm. the NBA, unfortunately, that's why they have this new in-season tournament that's trying to keep fan interest there during yeah. like the beginning parts of the season, because... For like the, I feel like the past five, ten years, everybody is like, yeah, let's wait, wait until the playoffs, and then I'll start caring about basketball. So, mm. no, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat interested. They've been struggling, so I, I want to see them trying to get back to get a, uh, you know, get back into the win column, 
and they've, yeah. they've won their past few i think so all right well there you go um there is a new indictment against hunter biden not sure if you saw uh last night that nine charges are uh, now leveled against the president's son this is in connection with uh the tax case against him where he prosecutors say failed to pay at least 1.4 million dollars in federal taxes in years 2016 through 2019 the president's son being charged after a grand jury indicted him on nine counts. Three of these are felonies. The charges include failing to file and pay taxes, tax evasion, and filing false tax returns. I understand all the taxes are paid now. Um, so when Michael Schur comes on, we'll talk to him about this and whether or not he thinks that this is overkill. You know, the government has its money. So nine charges would you or I face this type of um, of scrutiny if we hadn't paid our taxes, but then paid them back? I don't know if that's the case. And I, it feels unfair to me, but maybe it is fair. And I, I do think that if someone breaks the law, they should pay the price. So uh, that's something we'll be talking about as well. There is uh, a report out that shows the economy added 199,000 jobs in November. This is new data from the Labor Department saying the unemployment rate dipped to 3.7% last month. And this is a, a report that is a little bit stronger than it was expected. The worry or the, the thought is that the Federal Reserve could hold interest, interest rates steady for longer. And is it a sign that the economy is strong? And if so... Is that another feather in the, the cap of President Biden uh, that he will be able to tout? And is that, are people going to feel that? Because what we've heard is prices are higher, everything costs more, and it's President Biden's fault. But every time information comes out like this, where you know we have, again, 199,000 jobs added in November, is, is that... Are we able to, to separate, you know, that yes, maybe things cost a little more, although it does seem prices are coming down a little bit. Um, gas certainly is. From no, Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, gas. Yeah, uh, I saw totally. gas in the threes uh, the past day, like you barely the in the threes. threes. I Look, saw the this fours. is Costco. This oh, is Costco gas. Okay. Like. Yeah. Um, I saw the fours in Petaluma and Petaluma has really expensive gas. So that is under five. That was a pretty big deal. And I think that all goes to how we're feeling about the state of things and our own personal financial picture and whether we're able to buy the things that we need to buy and not feel completely strapped. So, you know, you would think with more jobs available that people would be doing better. But I think the economy is still going to be a main sticking point in uh, in the election coming up. This investigation, this House investigation is still underway of uh, the prestigious universities. They're calling it rampant anti-Semitism on college campuses. So you may have seen video of the House Education uh, House Committee on Education and the Workforce announcing this investigation into Harvard, MIT, and the University of Pennsylvania. The congressional hearing had the university presidents at the table. And they refused to say whether calls for genocide violate those individual universities' code of conduct and campus rules on harassment. Uh, I kind of talking earlier about free speech, the right to say what you want to say on college, college campuses uh, versus the right of some students, namely Jewish students on campus, to feel safe in their communities as well. So now we have a, a House committee investigating these college campuses. I don't know what the government can do to change college campus policies, but I think that we're going to see um, some changes maybe coming in the personnel and the leadership in those campuses. There's another story that I saw, and I'd like to talk to Michael Shore about this one as well when he comes on. But uh, Fonnie Willis, who, of course, is the the prosecutor in the Georgia case against uh, Donald Trump, is apparently closing in on what's being referred to as direct evidence against Donald Trump. So 
CNN is reporting that attorney Kenneth Chesborough, one of Trump's attorneys, is cooperating with authorities in Georgia and now also at least three other states as well. And this is, you know, Trump facing 91 felony charges in separate criminal cases, um, two of them federal, one in Georgia, state case, and then one in New York, which is a civil fraud trial. He's pleaded not guilty to everything. But Chesbro, it turns out, may testify about conversations in the White House when Trump was allegedly, I don't know, do we have to say allegedly anymore, trying to overturn the 2020 election result? Because I think we've all kind of seen the evidence there. Apparently, Chesbro told the Atlanta prosecutors he met with Trump in the White House in December of 2020 and also had other key meetings with Trump advisors. And uh, apparently, he is committed to testifying and may be able to offer direct evidence of Trump's involvement. So in addition to Georgia, Chesbro is cooperating with Michigan and Wisconsin in hopes of avoiding more criminal charges in those states, especially when it comes to the fake electors. And so um, Chesbro has been in contact with prosecutors in Arizona as well, where he plans to sit for an interview as part of that state ongoing investigation into fake electors there. So this starts in Georgia, but this is spreading wide, far, far and wide. Uh, Fonnie Willis, of course, the DA in Atlanta, overseeing this case against Trump, was the first to bring the state charges against Trump and Chesbro. I don't like that it seems like they got a slap on he got a slap on the wrist in order to to testify. But listen, if if his testimony leads to more people understanding what happened there and understanding that our democracy was at risk, people who somehow, some way, don't get that then okay, take the slap on the wrist. Because my hope is that people will get it and won't vote for Trump. Because as I said before, the closer he gets, right, we we overcome the hurdle of the primaries. And then he's running in the general election. So a step closer to the White House. With every step, I have more and more fear for this country. So if, if what it takes is to give Kenneth Chesbrough and others that I feel um, committed crimes against this country, I would even say treasonous crimes against, against this country, is how it feels to me, then I'll take that if it means that people will see the truth about Trump and in turn won't vote for him. That's that's how I'm feeling about that. It's how I'm I'm trying to feel. I'm trying not to feel angry that these people seem to be getting uh, getting off with uh, without much penalty. Spencer, good morning, says uh, Trump is more worried about losing his business than the criminal stuff. That's hitting him where it hurts, honestly. You know, hitting him in the uh, in the pocketbook is apparently what makes him the angriest. So uh, oh, Russ is glad that I didn't put a Trump picture up. All right. That's true. Jim writing this morning, I think the same penalty for the crime of pretending to be a cop is applied for the fake electors and people will know it is bad. Well, this the fake elector situation is heating up across America. We have um, fake electors now being charged in uh, in some states. In other states, I think it was Wisconsin that they had to come and apologize. Not apologize, not on my bad, I'm sorry, but actually had to come out publicly and say, the fake electors, that they would withdraw the papers that they had submitted that were fake, and also that they acknowledged that that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. And so that was their their punishment, it seems like. Mm. Karen writes, Trump is feeling pretty smug. He may go further and further and say enough extremely offensive stuff to turn more people away, hopefully. Karen, I don't know, because if you look at all the offensive things he's said, I mean, let's just pick out the two that stick out to me the most were the grab him by the pee, right? They didn't care about that, voted for him anyway. And the other one was the making fun of the disabled reporter. Those two stick out to me like just mouth dropping, right? Still elected. So if he can get away with saying that, I don't know. But I hear I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, oh, look at this. 
Is it Mark Thompson? I don't know. On tax evasion, Hunter is a JV rookie compared to Trump. Trump is the gold medalist in the Olympics of not paying taxes. Is that Mark Thompson on the chat from the cruise ship? I don't know. It's it's the utter hypocrisy that we could be so focused on Hunter Biden when you have someone like Trump who you have to realize there's a reason he didn't want us to see his tax returns all this year all those years right when you talk about the financial fraud going on with his case in New York and and the focus of Republicans is on Hunter Biden who's not even president or running for president mm. um yeah Jim Slayton this morning saying uh get what he says about the veterans, the disabled ones. Yeah, it's true. I mean, and if you can say these things, it's crazy. Andrew Peters doesn't want us to talk about Trump. It seems like Andrew wants to talk about not being able to buy a house with an 8% mortgage. Yes, um, Andrew, mortgages are really expensive. And also Trump. And also, you know, a focus on the hideousness and the hideous nature of what's happening in this country. I'm not diverting attention to something else when you have someone, uh, you know, sitting in a courtroom, a former president who's running for president, sitting in a courtroom accused of financial fraud, accused of um, trying to thwart democracy in this country by fixing elections. Are you kidding me? No. Is it important that uh, that mortgages cost more? Yes, it is. It's very important. But that's a whole different topic. Uh, B.W. Rock saying Trump paid that NYU uh, testifying yesterday uh, and today $877,000 to do so. You're talking about the uh, the the financial expert that was uh, appearing for the defense, that it explains a lot that you would have to pay someone to come testify you. I mean, I think that's normal in trials that they do that. I don't know. Uh, yes, Jim says there. That's expensive. It's true. Uh, and Spencer writing today. I think Trump was more embarrassed about it. Showed uh, how much money he lost, the most of any man in America in modern times. Yeah, great businessman, right? I'm telling you. But he's supposed to be the best businessman. No, he isn't the best businessman. Not even a little bit. All right, uh, let's do some news as we await Michael Shore. And again, we'll also talk uh, to Michael Snyder and John Daly. We'll have with uh, Friday Fabulous Florida. But let's do a little bit of news before we get into it, because what happens is I always forget to do it. And then by the time, you know, the show ends, I realize I haven't done any news at all. And I think it's important to hit the highlights. What do you think, Albert? Yeah, and it's uh, Friday. I feel like Fridays in general, not even just you, Kim. Uh, yeah. it's, we, we never get to news. So it's nice to get to news a little earlier. And then yeah. we'll get to Florida. Awesome. Mark Thompson Show. I'm Kim McAllister, and this report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee. I have my teas here that I've been trying this morning, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But first, I will say that Israeli forces are moving forward with their assault on southern Gaza. This comes as the U.S. has warned Israel that it must put a premium on civilian protection while it fights Hamas. Karem Shalom crossing from Israel into Gaza will reopen in the next few days for inspections and aid. Uh, trucks as supplies of water and food and medicine are now running short again. They want to get these aid trucks uh, back in there. As we mentioned here on the Mark Thompson Show, President Biden's son is facing federal tax charges. Special counsel David Weiss is charging Hunter Biden uh, after a grand jury indicted him on nine counts. Three of those are felonies. Again, the charges include failing to file and pay taxes, tax evasion, and filing false tax returns. This is a pretty big storm that's set to slam the eastern half of the United States this weekend. You've got severe thunderstorm warnings, heavy rain, strong winds, even snow could affect millions of people. This starts to take shape today, and then it gains strength on Saturday. The adverse weather is stretching more than 1,200 miles from the Gulf Coast all the way to the Canadian border. Rockets were fired at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad early this morning. The explosions were heard near the center of Baghdad at about four in the morning local time there. No reported casualties in this attack. An embassy spokesperson said the Iran-aligned militias in Iraq are believed to be behind the attack. 
the International Olympic Committee, will allow Russian and Belarusian athletes to compete in next year's Olympics in Paris. Athletes who qualify for the sport will participate as neutrals without flags. Athletes from Russia and Belarus had faced bans from international competitions after Russia's invasion in Ukraine. So again, now they will be able to participate once again. Two New York Police Department officers are credited with helping to catch a woman they think was trying to burn down Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthplace. Two NYPD officers were off duty last night. They were touring Atlanta when they spotted a woman pouring gasoline on the porch, the windows, and the bushes outside of the late civil rights leader's childhood home. Two tourists from Utah managed to get a a lighter out of her hand, and the NYPD officers tackled this woman, detaining her uh, for the local police there. So glad they happened upon it. The Supreme Court is deciding whether to take up a legal fight over the drug most commonly used for medication uh, for medical abortion. Earlier this year, Texas, a Texas-based federal judge invalidated the original approval of this drug, which happened two decades ago. If the Supreme Court justices decide not to intervene in the ongoing litigation, a ruling that limited the availability of the drug by mail would go into effect. So... Uh, some uh, something for us to to watch and be aware of. Vladimir Putin will run for re-election next year. Is it really an election? You gotta wonder. Uh, Putin has been in charge in Russia for 24 years, either as president or prime minister. Another presidential term will keep him in power until at least 2030. Yeah, like to see him lose an election in Russia. How's that going to play out? Oxford, Michigan high school shooter Ethan Crumley is being sentenced this morning for killing four students and injuring seven others in 2021. He used a gun purchased for him as an early Christmas present that year to carry out the shooting, and he now faces life in prison without parole despite being 15 years old at the time of that crime. Crumley was charged as an adult. He's been in adult prison since his arrest as well. I have a question for you. Uh... Usually it's Mark that comments on my news stories, but this one kind of goes to something that I've been talking a lot about in my home. And Albert, I'll ask you because my daughter is a freshman in high school and she's taking this honors English class. And in class, they're reading a book about a person that was wrongly convicted of a murder and was sentenced to die. And in school, they watch the movie that features the execution where they shave off the person's hair and eyebrows and everything. So these kids, these 14 year old kids are getting a front row seat. And there's been a lot of talk about in this house about whether children should be charged as adults. And I, it's a hard one because, you know, he, this four students were killed in this Michigan shooting. There's four students that will never have a chance to go on and, and, you know, have their whole lives in front of them and, uh, and have experienced love and marriage or, you know, success in careers or whatever they were going to do in their life is stripped and taken away. But he was 15 at the time. And now we have this now man being charged as an adult. Do you have thoughts on this, Albert? Yeah, it's just I feel like it's going to be that never ending like their kids, you know, and they'll they don't know any better. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, it's 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 just so severe what they've done that it's kind of like you have to treat them like adults. And unfortunately, you don't get another shot after taking at least you. Yeah, you you took someone else's like like life. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's move to X because uh, the CEO of X says the platform added more than 10 million users in December. Linda Yaccarino making this claim yesterday in a post on X. The platform doesn't typically release user data. It's unclear how the December signups compare to the monthly average, but it seems like more and more people are not using X and more and more advertisers are dropping X. So maybe that's why they feel they need to pop up and come out with information to the contrary. Uh, I don't know if that if that's the point or not. Um, okay, this, speaking of social media, Threads, which is the meta platform, is rolling out hashtags without hash symbols. 
Maybe this is the new thing. The major update went global yesterday, so users can tag one topic per post, and unlike typical hashtag, phrases with spaces can be used. So do we have a new search tool, a new way to do, uh, to, you know, to call attention to things without using that hashtag? No. Oh. Elon Musk, speaking of X, is asking the U.S. Supreme Court to undo his Twitter sitter agreement with the Securities and Exchange Commission. The deal between Musk, Tesla, and the SEC requires anything Musk posts on X to be approved first. Musk's attorney said the agreement set an unconstitu uh, unconstitutional condition that violates his free speech rights. Although... You know, he was posting things that were harmful to the stock of his company, to the shareholders, some things that were uh, Ill illegal financially uh, to say. So he may need some oversight, he may not be ready to not have oversight at this point. I don't know. Um in San Francisco, they're cracking down on non-Chinese political candidates appropriating Chinese names in order to get extra votes. Candidates in the, the city, San Francisco, have traditionally chosen Mandarin and Cantonese names to appear on the ballot as a way to appeal to Asian American voters. A new policy from the San Francisco Department of Elections says, no, candidates are required now to submit evidence showing that they have used a Chinese name for at least two years before it's going to be allowed on any ballot. A state bill passed in 2019 said candidates who didn't did not have a Chinese name at birth can only use a phonetic translation of their given name. Can't take on a Chinese name. That seems reasonable to me. I mean, you want your name translated so that people can read it in any language, but to kind of cheat so that people think that you're someone you're not, that seems kind of oogie to me. I don't know. All right. Uh, this report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee. And, you know, they sent me a box of 13 teas. So I've been doing my 13 days of tea, but I missed a day. So now I have uh, two, <laughs> two in one day is what I have going here. And I'm, I'm going to be completely and brutally honest about what I think about them. Um, I have in this hand chamomile. And in this hand, I have lemon mint. I don't think the lemon mint is good as iced tea, but I also don't like lemon in my tea. So this one I'm going to set aside. But this one, the chamomile, amazing. And I think it'll be really good hot what? or cold. Mm, my favorites so far have been the, uh, the mango for iced tea, the hibiscus for iced tea. Also, and while I don't like the lemon mint, I really loved the ginger mint and the Moroccan mint. So refreshing and good. Of course, Mark's favorite coffee is Coachella Valley coffee. So if you're a coffee drinker, you're going to love it. A lot of people have ordered it and are supporting our sponsors, which we're so appreciative of. You can get 10% by entering Mark T. Hey, which one do you use, Mark Thompson? <laughs> Mark Thompson's not here. We finally got rid of that guy. But, uh, but check out CoachellaValleyCoffee.com, CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. Enter Mark T at checkout. And the teas that I liked, I did order a couple to give us stocking stuffers to my mom and sister, because we all really love iced tea. So if that sounds like something uh, that would be good, again, the ones I like, the Earl Grey for hot, that's good. Um, I'll say the chamomile, good, hot or cold, the hibiscus, the ginger mint, the Moroccan mint, all really good. And my daughter is loving the, the chai tea as well from them. So they have a lot of really good options. Again, Mark T gets you 10% off. I'm Kim McAllister, and this is The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. It was great. I loved it. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. Morning. You cannot say you love your country. Where are my weed smokers at? Stay at home and get baked. Yeah, it is the Mark Thompson show. And here we are, day two of Mark Thompson being absent from the Mark Thompson show. But that's all right. We will carry on in his stead. And we will do the things we do, like uh, Flor Fa <laughs> Friday Fabulous Florida. I can say it. We'll get it right. Uh, so let's bring on John Daly as we jump in and uh, and start talking about that wacky estate. Hi, John Daly. Hello, Kim McAllister. I asked you yesterday, are you going to get the name of the segment correct? 
I did. I stumbled over it, but I did get it right. Wow. I get it. I get a buzz for that, huh? All right. All right, Albert. Uh, does let's... anybody does anybody believe that um, X has ten million new followers? No. It, like Vlad bought three thousand. I don't believe it. I think they're suffering so much that they're trying to come out with something, anything that will make them look better, and it, it's not happening. Yeah. Mm -mm. No. No. Not happening. All right. Let's kick it off. It is Friday, fabulous Florida. It's time for Friday Fabulous Florida. There is a gigantic alligator in my kitchen. A look at the weirdest stories from our weirdest state. Well, this first story is pretty bizarre when you talk about um, sausages being involved in a news story. So what happened here what? is that... Two brothers had a disagreement, as brothers are wont to do. About their sausages? <laughs> but no. According to the arrest affidavit from the Pinellas County Police Department, 60-year-old Ray Allen got into this heated argument with his older brother in the backyard of their home in St. Petersburg. Police say Allen hurled sausages directly toward his brother at the right side of his brother's face. When authorities arrived, they broke up the feuding brothers. They arrested Allen. Uh, the emergency, the paramedics that responded, used a saline solution to wash out the victim's eyes. I guess maybe he had sausage in his eyes. This was a, a rough one. Sausage Allen, juice. Sausage burns. juice. Yeah, I, maybe. Allen was arrested on a charge of domestic battery booked into the Pinellas County Jail. I guess it's one of those things you, when you're angry, you just attack with whatever you happen to have closest. Yeah, there My are man. a lot of sausage I'm sorry. <laughs> there are a lot of sausage attacks in the news. Are there? Yeah. yeah. Well, I shocked this one up to another one. Maybe the they judge, were spicy. Spicy sausages? Yeah. The judge is ruling uh, that these brothers are now not able to contact each other after their dispute over sausages in Pinellas County. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to a Panera Bread. Oh, yeah. But there's a story. This is a serious one. A Florida man has died after drinking their caffeinated charged lemonade. And he's not the first one. Remember, yeah. uh, Panera had to issue a, a warning to people yeah. that there was a lot of caffeine in this drink. Now Panera Bread is facing a second wrongful death lawsuit regarding its caffeinated charged lemonade. Panera's lemonade drink causing the death of this Florida man, 46-year-old Dennis Brown. He went into cardiac arrest when he left this Jesus. restaurant. I know. He, he drank this lemonade with his dinner at the Panera Bread right near his workplace in Florida, uh, and he died while he was walking home after he left that restaurant. The lawsuit filed on his behalf says he'd been drinking the lemonade for six days, and he was a member of Panera's Unlimited Sip Club, where you oh, can order you unlimited drinks. So this is a so huge he must have had dose a more of than one more than one serving a day. Yeah, because uh, it's a it's a huge number of caffeine. And let me tell you how much. According to Panera's menu, a large charged lemonade has 390 milligrams of caffeine. The FDA's daily maximum intake is 400 milligrams. So one of them has 390 milligrams, close to yeah, the, the a daily cup of coffee limit. is usually about. It's not fake. That's real. Panera releasing a statement about what happened, saying they're expressing their deep sympathy to Brown's family. Based on the investigation, they believe his passing was not caused by one of their products. <laughs> they view the lawsuit filed by the, the same law firm as a previous claim to be without merit. And Panera says they stand firmly by the safety of their products. It's time this to comes, pull the lemonades. Right? I mean, this comes after a 21-year-old University of Pennsylvania student died when she didn't realize that it had that much caffeine because at, at that point there were no signs and she died as well from a heart condition. It was so, wrong, you it have was the, stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. Even if you have the caffeine numbers there, most people aren't familiar with that, what that means. Right. It's just a stupid idea. No, no. I mean, I get that they're trying to hone in on the the energy drink yeah. thing, but no. Well, and Panera usually specializes in very bland boring food you know uh one time uh pat thurston asked on air what is white people food because we're talking about different <laughs> ethnicities and i said panera panera is white people panera food. is white people food yeah. 
Um, this is I love a little alligator on uh, the the Friday segment. So let's talk about Gatorland, and they're making history with the birth of an extremely rare white alligator. There are only eight of these in the world. One oh, of them is in love San Panera. Francisco. We yeah, love Panera. <laughs> There's never been anything like this. One of these is in San Francisco. We have a white alligator. I think his name is Claude. Yeah, and Claude. he's at the Academy of Science in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. But this is a new little one. This is, they call it a white Christmas at Gatorland this year. This is a rare, leucistic white alligator, one of eight in the entire world. It's the first ever alligator of its kind to be born in human care, and it makes Gatorland the owner of the largest collection of rare, leucistic alligators in the world. Looks they more pink, this... actually, but I guess most white people do, too. Well, and I think when you're maybe you're a baby gator, you look more pink, and as you grow older, you get a little whiter. I don't know. We'll have to I don't know how that works with, with, I mean, he's obviously at Gatorland, so he doesn't have to worry about predators, or maybe they don't have to worry about predators. I don't know. But I don't, when you're a baby gator and you're white and you may stand out, I don't know how that works. But Gatorland CEO is so excited, they say, for the first time since this nest of leucistic alligators was discovered in the swamps of Louisiana 36 years ago, we have the first birth of a solid white alligator ever recorded from those original alligators. It's beyond rare. They call it absolutely extraordinary. It is a baby girl alligator. Uh, she has a normal colored brother. They were uh, weighing 96 grams. They're healthy. They get an A plus for their health uh, check. At this point, they're eating bite sized pieces of raw chicken and getting nutritional supplements. Uh, supplements. But this is the rarest genetic variation of the American alligator. They're not no, no lemonade. What? They may, you know, I may have have been confused because they say these are not to be confused with albino alligators, mm. which have pink eyes and a complete loss of pigment. Leucistic alligators, leucistic alligators have blue eyes instead. So they're a little different. And I'm not sure if Claude in San Francisco is a leucistic or if he's just an albino. I think he might be an albino alligator. He's an albino alligator. Yeah, he's yeah. Albino. Claude is? Okay. Yeah. So that's not what this guy is. But... It's interesting. He's and he has poor eyesight. Yeah. Oh, do, uh, Claude does. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the, uh, you know, the it's a genetic thing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's talk about a high speed chase out of Florida. Uh, this promising. is a Florida man arrested in East Providence after a high speed chase and a shooting incident as well. The police in East Providence are releasing the identity of a shooting suspect that was arrested after this high-speed chase ended on Friday. His name is uh, Joshua Paveo. He's 43 years old from Kissimmee, Florida. He's been arrested and charged with multiple felonies. How this all played out is that police got a 911 call uh, when shots were fired at about 2.30 in the afternoon Friday at a house when they arrived, they found at least one rear window of a vehicle at that home had been shot out. And then they saw his vehicle fleeing the scene. A detective tried to stop the vehicle, but that didn't work. This man apparently continued oh. to flee. Uh -huh. Look at that. Yeah. Police said a long gun magazine was either discarded or fell from the vehicle uh, as the, the chase went on. Driver ran a red light, collided with three other vehicles, then tried to run on foot. Officers had to chase him down and take him into a custody in a parking lot. But multiple loaded long gun magazines were ejected from the suspect's vehicle in this collision. They were found scattered throughout the road. And police said they found thousands of rounds of ammunition in three duffel bags and a significant number of loose rounds in the vehicle. Uh, other people in other cars receive minor injuries in all of this. So Paveo is now charged with possessing large capacity a feeding device, 106 counts, two counts of license or permit required for carrying a pistol, discharge of a firearm from a motor vehicle, firing in a compact area, eluding an officer in a high-speed pursuit, uh, stop it, duty to stop for an accident resulting in injury, because he didn't stop, duty to stop for an accident with an occupied vehicle, didn't stop, vandalism and obstruction. So he's got a lot to answer for here. At this point. Oh, Russ in the chat says he'll probably get charged with littering. <laughs> littering as well. That, that's another one they can throw at him. Yeah. 
<laughs> it doesn't say anything about alcohol being involved, but it looks like uh, he was up to no good for sure. A boy made a hoax 911 call about a school shooting because he wanted to go home early. Oh. What? No. Mm -mm. This boy, 11 years old, arrested this week for alleg allegedly making one of these hoax 911 calls about a school shooter. So police come mm. out in force to this school. They evacuate the whole building. The Marion County Sheriff's Office said it received the call Tuesday at about 930 in the morning at Horizon Academy in Ocala, Florida. After a search... Authorities determined there weren't any armed assailants, weapons, or injured students or staff. Nothing was going on there at the school. The investigation uh, later revealed that a student allegedly made this call because he wanted to go home early. The student put fear into his fellow students, staff, parents. The sheriff said, for what? Because you wanted to go home? He said, I will not tolerate my young citizens being fearful of going to school because you wanted to be a jokester in hopes of going home. He's on a list now. He is you know, on all the, the all list. The sheriffs, all the sheriffs in Florida are going to have his name. They're like, that kid. Yeah. In the audio of the 911 call that the, they did release, they're not, not releasing his name because he's a minor, but they did release the 911 call. You can it's hear like his the audition boy, tape for Florida his, Man. You can hear the boy telling the dispatcher, help me. There's a shooter walking through the hallway. I mean, imagine how fast that gets the Just officer out there. Just go home sick. No. Right. You way. have a tummy ache. Whatever happened to that? I have a tummy Ooh, ache. It's or, a wild idea, but it just might work. When the dispatcher tried to get more information, he said, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And then the line disconnected. Wow. Pretty dramatic. Yeah, it really is. He's got a flair for the dramatic, this one. Um, as a precaution, the school placed on lockdown as they investigated. But yeah, he's in some trouble. In some trouble. This, another animal story out of Florida. A Florida bear attacks and then takes off with a reindeer Christmas decoration. Come on mm -hmm. now. <laughs> this is a black bear caught on a Florida home surveillance camera asserting its dominance over the home's Christmas reindeer decor. The, uh, the... The camera, the surveillance camera, picked up this pretty funny exchange in Longwood, Florida. Happened in the middle of the night at about 3.42 in the morning. The ring camera captures this black bear curiously approaching three lit up reindeer Christmas decorations. The bear is then seen sniffing out the first lit up reindeer before knocking it down with his paw. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny. The video is cute. Let's watch it. So you can see there the bear kind of sniffing around. He knocks over one of them. Uh, the bear is seen crushing the outdoor decoration before moving on to the next reindeer. Apparently he likes the next one, though. It seems pretty good. And then a few moments later, you can see the bear dragging the entire reindeer by the mouth away from the house. Maybe so he just thinks he gets... it's, it's tacky and he's like, too much, too much, dude. One. Like, One's enough. We one, don't go for fake animals. One is I, enough. I don't know. It's pretty funny. The things that are caught on these home video cameras or ring cameras, pretty great sometimes. Because you would never have known that. And you know, you would probably wake up in the morning and go, oh my God, someone vandalized yeah. our Christmas display and someone stole our reindeer. You would think that was human caused until you no, go back just, to the ring cam and see it was a black bear. Yeah, yeah. he's passing judgment. Yeah, no, that's a pretty good one. Uh, a Florida woman sets a Tinder date, a Tinder date's car on fire over money. You could say this is a date from absolute hell. Mm -mm. This woman from Miami is, uh, she's now in a, a bit of trouble after apparently going on a date with this man. Uh, they go to a hotel mm -hmm. and she subsequently asks him for money. He told police she was angered by his response, that I guess he's not giving her any money, and poured what smelled like gasoline on the Jeez. passenger seat of his car before lighting it on fire. So she had it ready to go. She, kind of. I, something something happened with her. I don't know. But she uh, was charged Monday in this case, booked into the Miami-Dade County Jail for setting her Tinder date's car on fire. Are you willing you... to bet your lunch? <laughs> Alcohol was involved? Mm. I might be willing to bet that. I'd be I don't willing know. to bet my lunch that there's alcohol involved. 
Now, she says she was being trafficked and asked to perform a sex acts for money. That's and why then, she was carrying the gasoline. And that's why she poured the gas on the man's car and set it on fire as well. You never know when you're going to be trafficked, so you better bring some gasoline along. Is that a thing? Because I thought, isn't Tinder like a... I don't know if you could say it's a legit dating app. Is that a way to meet prostitutes as well? You're asking me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I would say that, yeah, probably. Well, not prostitutes. Let's go to Albert. Let's go to the is, commish. That is the hookup app. Kim. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, not tech, not, it's not meant for it, but it's just a lot of people do use that for hooking up more than other apps. So we're not surprised that prostitution was involved in a Tinder hookup. I mean, the like John said, where, where did she have the gasoline? And right. like, she was ready to go. She was ready to go. You put that into your algorithm of uh, swiping yeah. left and right. On, oh, she looks like she got a like a thing of gas. Put my car on fire. It was pretty good. Although, if you do want to start a fire, soak your Tinder in gasoline. There you go. Well, Get let's it? take. Tinder? Let's go <laughs> Tinder. Yeah, Tinder. Tinder flames. Fire, yeah. Let's go uh, back over it and uh, kind of rehash what we had here before you guys vote. On your favorite story from Florida, we had the Florida man hurling sausage at his older brother during a disagreement. Mm, strong. We had the Florida man uh, dying after drinking Panera Bread's caffeinated charged lemonade. Yeah. We had the Gatorland making history with this extremely rare white little baby gator. Only eight of them in the world. Yeah. We had the Florida man arrested after this high-speed chase and shooting incident with quite a, a haul of uh, of bullets and magazines and loot found afterward. We had this little boy, 11 years old, making a hoax 911 call about a school shooting because he wanted to go home early. And then we had the Florida bear attacking the reindeer and dragging it off. The Florida woman uh, setting the Tinder date's car on fire. I'll ask you, John Daly. Do you have a favorite? Oh, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to two. I like the bear with taste. Take you down mm -hmm. the gaudy uh, Christmas decorations. Yep. But I think I have to go with sausage toss this week. Really? Yeah. What is right it about the, the what's the so about the sausage it's toss just, that gets your attention? It's just totally Florida. Yeah, it is a little Florida. Yeah. What do you think, Albert? I do like the sausage toss too because they did mention in the article that they did use a a saline like solution to. Yeah. Right. To help they must the have been sauce, uh, the like uh, spicy links. There's, the spicy links. It had to be in there. raw. <laughs> Maybe it right. had to, if it was a cooked, I don't think they're doing that. You just walk that one off. Yeah. Right, I like the right, right. Fight thing, and the, I think the gator is cool, yeah. but yeah, the bear, I had to go with the bear attack because you know, it's just a, yeah. it's a bear in the wild killing a yeah. deer. It's easy. It's easy lunch. So I would go with a gator usually, but I have to agree with you. I'm going with the bear attacking the Christmas decorations. Although that could happen anywhere that there are, are bears. I just think that video is so funny. Uh, so I'll do that. What do we have in the chat, Albert? What's the, uh, the bear the... attack is actually also popular in the chat. 35% uh, mm. of the vote. Uh, okay. Followed by the sausages being thrown. So I think those Tin... were the clear favorites this week. Tinder fire getting some love as well. Uh, John says Sausage King of Florida is the winner. And Julie is liking the bear. Walter always votes for the gator. Um, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a sausage, says uh, says Michael. Pretty funny. Well, if it comes at you fast, you know. <laughs> if it comes at you, sausage You're not dodging. expecting it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's a new sport, sausage dodging. Maybe we right. could add that to the Florida Olympics, is. right? Yeah. We know what we yeah. should do. Maybe we'll maybe I'll institute this while Mark Thompson is away. We should take the favorites from every week and put them all head to head in like a floor a, a Florida championship competition. Yeah, I was thinking of that of uh, just the best of Florida for mm -hmm. next Mark's Madness to to yep. kind of switch things up. So Kim, you waited to the end of the year to come up with that idea. <laughs> you know. Yeah, what? and also Kim, you're, you're you're giving me more work here, Kim. I yeah. like the bar super Seas low. Please get degrees. So just fill in and stop having ideas. All yeah. right. Okay, I got you guys. I got you, uh, Farmer John. It is a great sausage. idea, and I like. Yeah. I, like I said, I have been. I don't think it's even my idea. I think um, that might have been. I might be giving credit to somebody. Shadow Albert, producer why Calvin is Kim Wong. Talking right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, M Oak says sausage dodging is on Tinder. Look yeah, at all the things I, on Tinder. I that's didn't what realize. I was going to say it's already yeah. a sport. I didn't know. I didn't know. All right, uh, this has been Friday Fabulous Florida. This has been Friday Fabulous Florida. There is a gigantic alligator in my kitchen. Y'all come back now, here. Yeah? 
Daly, thank you so much for joining us every Friday and giving us your time for Friday Fabulous Florida. You make it so much fun. You're welcome. I want everyone to join yeah. us on the afterparty.live. Um, do you like my my name in Mandarin? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm it's pandering. Great. I'm pandering to the Asian community. <laughs> All right. I'll see you on the After Party Live. Thank you, John Daly. See ya. Bye. <laughs> And thank you to Albert for putting that uh, that awesome segment together. We so appreciate it. It's so much fun every week. All right. Um, Michael Shore should be hopping up here in just a few minutes. We have uh, to talk about the attorney for former President Trump, Kenneth Chesbrough, cooperating now in all of these fake elector schemes. Also wanted to talk to him about a report out of the LA Times last night that indicates that former Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy is benefiting, um, we could say, bigly by with PAC money paying for some pretty luxurious items. We're talking hotel, fancy hotels and resorts, luxury uh, travel, uh, all kinds of things. So we'll talk to him about that as well. I mean, is anybody surprised? Isn't that kind of, you know, you expect politicians to be having their hand out? Mm, it's too bad. Also, we'll talk to Michael Shore about the Republican debates that are being added. And uh, Barbara Lee lagging now in the Senate race in California. So we'll talk about that as well. And again, we have Michael Snyder coming up as well. Let's do a little bit more news before we get to Michael Shore here on The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Yes, on the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister, and this report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Yay! The Israel-Hamas war still raging in the Gaza Strip. The U.S., the warning Israel, must put a premium on civilian protection. But a major crossing from Israel into Gaza is set to reopen to allow supplies of water, food, and medicine to arrive by truck. The FDA is approving sickle cell treatments that include CRISPR gene editing technology. First it happened in the UK, now it's happening here in America as well, and it could open the door for thousands of patients in the United States to receive a treatment that can minimize painful effects of this disease. Health officials say a sickle cell disease affects about 100,000 Americans, specifically Black Americans with African ancestry. Uh, for the second time in a week, a woman in the United States has filed a lawsuit asking for permission to get an abortion. The first one was in Texas. Kate Cox won a temporary restraining order granting her access. Now, a woman in Kentucky is suing on the grounds that abortion is a critical component of reproductive health care. We'll see how these uh, lawsuits end up. Michelob Ultra being named the official global beer sponsor of Conmebol Copa America USA 2024. What? As part of the announcement, Anheuser-Busch InBev welcomed soccer superstar Lionel Messi to announce Messi as its brand ambassador. The United States will host Conmebol Copa America in June and July of next year. Disney and Brittany Griner are teaming up to tell her story. The WNBA star will give Disney exclusive rights to share her story through a documentary from ESPN Films, a scripted series through ABC Signature, and an exclusive interview with ABC News anchor Robin Roberts. Griner, of course, was arrested in February of 2022 at a Moscow airport for cannabis possession, which led to her being held for months in prison uh, in Russia. And again, now we get to hear her story and hear more about what she experienced on a day-to-day -day basis, being locked up there, what she thought her future may become uh, on, I guess, the Disney Channel and ESPN, etc. The former CEO of Goodwill Sacramento arrested yesterday and charged with stealing more than $1 million. Richard Allen Abruski was uh, in charge of the Goodwill Sacramento Valley and Northern Nevada. Abruski is alleged to have directed Goodwill to pay about $1.4 million into a fake company he set up. He is charged with what? aggravated identity theft, three counts of monetary transactions with proceeds of specific unlawful activity, 
Goodwill Sacramento said it tipped off authorities to the fraud after internal audits and an investigation. My bad. I'm sorry. He could face 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine for each of the nine counts going on with that. Uh, It looks like California could be on the verge of massive spending cuts. The Legislative Analyst Office says the state is facing a $68 billion budget shortfall after months of low tax revenue. My, how times have changed. Just a couple years ago, we had a surplus. Not so much anymore. The report points out there are tools to fix the problem, such as nearly $38 billion in reserves, but they're urging Governor Gavin Newsom to consider declaring an emergency to tap into this rainy day fund. He is due to present the first budget draft next month and will then negotiate with lawmakers through June on closing that gap. While California is just days away from giving millions of people a pay raise, the minimum wage increases 50 cents to $16 an hour starting on January 1st in the state of California. It is one of several laws going into effect on New Year's Day. Others include adding speed cameras in six cities, more training for anyone with a concealed carry permit, more paid sick leave, the recycling of wine bottles, allowing veterinary video appointments, and making campsite reservations easier. Some of the new laws coming up. Another delay for this year's Dungeness crab season, California regulators just pushed it out at least two more weeks because of humpback whales spotted off of our coast. The move protecting them from getting caught in the fishing gear. Restrictions on recreational crab traps will be lifted a week from tomorrow along the Mendocino coast of uh, North Point Arena to the Oregon border. And then the next risk assessment uh, for the whales comes December 21st. So we'll see how that goes. California is ranking highest in the list of the most loathed highways. What's your most loathed highway, Albert? No hesitation. 880 is awful. <laughs> 880? I, av- I avoid it. I try to. I'm, I'm here in Union City in the East Bay, so 880 is kind of like I have to take it, but I try to avoid it at all costs. Ah, yes. The nasty Nimitz. Well, three California freeways are being called the most loathed in the nation. A car dealership surveyed people all over. They found California takes the top three spots out of 100. Drivers rank Highway 101 the worst for congestion, especially in areas like Los Angeles and San Francisco. I-5 came came in second, followed by the 405 freeway in Southern I, California. Your yeah, 880 didn't make the list. No, I predicted because down south is really it's really bad. 405 mm-hmm. and the five for sure and then uh and one even one one up here i yeah it's it's a it's a nightmare yeah it's a mess all right are you ready for this this is santa con get ready for the sea of red to converge on san francisco it happens tomorrow santa con is back for its 28th year which is pretty surprising when 28 years of something i mean that's a lot of drinking that's a lot of santas that's a you know, that's quite a tradition. People are encouraged to dress up as Santa, Mrs. Claus, or a favorite holiday character for what's described as the biggest bar crawl in the nation. The fun kicking off at noon in Union Square next to the ice skating rink and the Christmas tree. Those going are asked to bring a toy for the fire department's toy drive as well. So here comes SantaCon. That's going to be good. Uh, This report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. And you know, out at Tenuta, you get 10% off for being a Mark Thompson Show listener. You do have to call them, and you do have to say the so-called phrase that pays, which is smash it with your iron rod. with your iron rod. (laughs) You call Rich out at Tenuta at 925-699-45. I'd be willing to bet my lunch that there's alcohol involved. I'll say the number again. It is 925-699-4576. And he's saying, make sure that you get your orders in for the holidays so you can get your wine. And here's the video that Rich sent about getting your picture with Santa taken at the winery. Happy holidays to the Mark Thompson show. Mark, Kim, Albert, Tony, all the listeners. Tanita Vineyards here in Livermore. Santa, that's me. I'm here every Saturday and Sunday from 1 to 3 p.m. Pictures with Santa are free. Uh, We can't thank you enough for all your support. And we just love the Mark Thompson Show. We love Mark, Kim, Albert, Tony, everybody. So just have a happy and safe holiday season. And we hope to see you out here at Tenuta 
Call my friend Rich. His number is 925-699-4576. Thanks. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to everyone out at Tenuta as well. I'm Kim McAllister. This is The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. All right. It's a conversation I wait for all week long. I just love him so much. It is Michael Schur coming in to talk politics, and I'm so grateful. And this week, he's a little busy. Looks like he's ready to join us from the automobile. Let's go right to him. Hi, Michael Schur. How are you, Kim? Yeah, sorry about the, uh, sorry about this, but I'm on the road all week, and uh, this is what we're going to have to deal with today. Listen, I will take you however I can get you from the. You've been in the hotel rooms and now cars. This is amazing. I'll, I just yeah. love it. So our top story on the Mark Thompson show this week uh, is one that, or this today rather, is one that popped up late last night, and it is revelations about former Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. And the fact that PAC money has been used to pay for uh, hotel stays at luxury resorts, uh, private jet travel, fancy, fancy restaurants, more than a million dollars, his PAC. And I guess that is double the number that the other top seven leaders in both the House and the Senate combined have spent on such, you know, travel and and dinner expenses. So he is living large off of his pack. Should we be surprised by this? You know, these are the sorts of stories that I don't get uh, too upset about because there's somebody's got to be in first place for money spent. (laughs) And I guess if if you say it's more than twice, it's more than twice. I think it's a failure of the system more than it's a failure of the former speaker. So, I, you know, uh, there's a lot to be critical of uh, when it comes uh, and Republicans and Democrats alike have have joined in that fray when it comes to criticizing Kevin McCarthy. And perhaps he did too much of this. He was a one of the reasons that a lot of Republicans bemoaned his departure for, uh, from the speaker's chair is that he was a prolific fundraiser. Yeah. And how do you become a prolific fundraiser? By using money that is being given to go out and raise more money. And that's what is so messed up about the American uh, political system with with uh, just sort of unchecked uh, money in politics and uh, supported by the Supreme Court and 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 also by the fact that, you know, you can you can bundle money in this way and give to to, to political political action committees, and it doesn't matter how they make their money and how they spend it. Are you sorry to see Kevin McCarthy check out of Congress? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it in that way, um, mm-hmm. but, but uh, so no, uh, mm-hmm. but I, and I'm not surprised that he's leaving either. And he's, you know, he sold his soul in many different ways uh, previously and, and subsequently. And I think that that that's you sort of reap what you sow in that way. But he also was in an untenable situation because of the way the Republican uh, House uh, caucus is fractured in, in, in a way that makes people beholden to a minority of their party. If you look at the same thing on the Democratic side, and this frustrates progressives to no end, as it frustrated conservatives when they didn't have as much power, is, is you look at what is the minority of that caucus on the Democratic side. And they never have complete control over the leadership, nor should any minority within a caucus. But and but it frustrates the people who who are there. Kevin McCarthy was in a really tough spot, uh, but I don't think there are a lot of people crying for Kevin McCarthy. No, no, I don't think so either. Let's go to Kenneth Chesbrough now, because it looks like he's, you know, in Georgia, he kind of got a slap on the wrist in order to to testify, you know, for in order to for an exchange for his testimony, I should say. But now we have word that he's talking to other states as well when it comes to fake electors. This fake elector uh, situation finally is kind of coming to a head. And so he's talking to... Um, uh, Arizona, apparently meeting with officials in Arizona, also Michigan uh, and Wisconsin. So, yeah. you know, this is this could be a big, big thing. And Fonnie Willis, who is, of course, the prosecutor in the Georgia case, is saying um, this is direct evidence that he may have against Donald Trump. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's why people have looked at the Atlanta case, uh, both the coercion and the fake elector scheme, uh, as one of the sort of top rung, top tier uh, charges against the former president. And yeah, I mean, when you get these people to start talking, it, like, you know, we all watch true crime, right? I mean, we, we've seen it on TV at the smallest level and the largest level. Mm -hmm. Once you get people on the other side talking, then you start to hear deals begin and you also see convictions. And I think that's why a lot of the people that are loyal still to the to, to Trump are, are seeing, um, you know, are, are starting to worry about all of this caving. It's why even people are starting to look at Republican competitors in the primary race as in a more serious way than they were before, because from within the Republican Party, there is, you know, a fear that, that the former president may not be able to stand. Speaking of the um, the candidates, we saw the recent debate, which kind of was a bit of a mess. And I thought that was going to be the last one. But now ABC and CNN are going to hold two more apparently in the month of January, two days apart, competing for debates number five and six when it comes to the Republican uh, presidential primary debates. Do we need to see more from them? Well, I mean, we might not need to, but maybe yeah. the voters in Iowa who are going to be caucusing in January need to yeah. see them. I, it's it's a rite of passage, these regular debates among candidates, and they are the candidates, and Trump is invited each time. And even, you'll remember, in Iowa, as in the 2016 election, uh, Trump didn't attend one of the debates. He went and had his own uh, kind of rally at Drake University where he took money from veterans. It was supposed to be in uh, support of veterans, and nobody really ever knew what happened to the money that he got from the veterans that he was supposed to be giving to, um, you know, he's supposed to be giving money to the veterans and nobody ever knew if he did that. Um, I, I think that, that, yeah, sure, it, it's a good thing. I think all these debates are a mess. I don't know really, in fairness, when we last said that, and we have said it, but when, oh, that was a really great debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's not something we regularly hear anymore. And. But I, I think in the last cycle, there was a Democratic debate or two that people said, OK, there was a lot more substance. I do think that when you watched the, the debate from last Wednesday night, you did see in or the, a couple of nights ago, you, you know, Chris Christie, I think, gave a real case as to why uh, his opponents are are not viable because of their blind support of someone who he has criticized immensely. Of course, he's not going anywhere in the polls. He has admitted as much, but I, I think as that narrative begins to seep in a little bit, it could have an effect, and two more debates may help that as well. You mentioned a question mark over Donald Trump, especially with all these legal cases playing out. But there's an article today where Mitt Romney and Lindsey Graham and others are saying, ah, it looks like the cake is baked. It looks like Trump's the nominee. And this is just what the, you know, we're, we're kind of now putting a, a stake in it and moving forward because that's how it appears. Yeah, I don't dispute that either. What I'm just saying is that it might not be up to to common wisdom here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, what I believe what Graham and Romney say, and I think the vast majority of people do, but there's something we don't know yet. And that's something we don't know could change the equation of this election immediately. And so, um, I think the people that are hoping for that are looking at the cases like you were just talking about, Kim, and, you know, the Chesbro stuff in those four states and saying, well, you know what, maybe that's going to be the thing that finally makes it so this guy can't run. Right. I mean, he's a Chris Christie the other day called him a felon who can't might not even be able to vote in the next election. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd be able to run. I, I, I don't know. And I, I, it makes a lot of sense. It does look like this cake is baked, but it also looks like the recipe for this cake is very flimsy. And so on both sides, really. So we'll see. Do I have you for a couple more minutes or do you have to go? Uh, no, no. Uh, you got me. You got me for a couple more minutes. I, okay. Because you know, I know you said you might have to cut it short today. Yeah, so four or five minutes. I think just we're good. Raise your hand if you got a jam. But I wanted to bring up the raise charges. Your that, <laughs> raise your uh, raise your hand if you think that maybe there's too many charges filed against Hunter Biden. Nine counts, three of them felonies in this tax evasion case. And while I don't think that um, 
that it's not unreasonable for people who have not paid their taxes to face charges. I wonder if you or I had done the same thing, but we didn't have that Biden name and our father wasn't president, if we had been, if we would be facing the same penalties. Yeah, you know, a lot of Republicans, a lot of Trump supporters that I speak to out here in the world um, uh, think that uh, Hunter Biden's, he's getting too good a deal or he got too good a de- of a what? deal last <laughs> and that yeah, no, really, that they think that if it were anybody else, I mean, that's that's the sort of blinders on that people have. If it were anybody else, he'd be in jail. Well, that's not true. If there were anybody else, he wouldn't be treated as harshly as this. You know, I, the optimistic way of looking at this, and a lawyer I spoke to yesterday said this is, is that, you know, the more charges you have, the easier it is to deal and, 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 and get a settlement because you can... Uh, they can drop a bunch of them and you can make a, a deal on a couple of them and then everybody yeah. goes happy. So, yeah, it's it's an, it, they, they really threw the book at somebody. Um, and if it were you or me, they would not uh, throw the book at us in the same way, for sure. Yeah, it doesn't seem quite fair to me. You know, right. and I want it. To, I want it to be fair. If he's done something wrong, he should pay the price for that. But it seems yeah. like this price is awfully heavy. It, it is, and w- which uh, the price he ends up paying will not be as severe as it sounds when the when the um, when the you know indictments are handed down. So it's a little different. But when what you're looking at, you know, is I, I wouldn't say it's politicized. It's the opposite of politicization. You have a justice department that is going after the son of a president. So mm-hmm. it is it is actually you know the other side says, oh, it's a go- a, a witch hunt. It's a partisan witch hunt. Uh, for Donald Trump, um, you don't hear that as much from the Democrats. And again, it's not a former president; it's the son of a president who is not at all politically involved. Nonetheless, it's it's the last name, and it's it's a, an election year. Do you think that if Hunter Biden is convicted, that his father would pardon him? Did I lose you? No, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh no! Can you hear me? Uh, I you know. Uh, I, yeah, I can hear you. Um, do I think that, you know, maybe what, <laughs> what's that? Are we losing? I, I'm no, no, I hear I you. Have you. Can you hear me? I can totally hear you. I, I was asking you if you think that, that president little... Biden would pardon his son if convicted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I can. I can hear Hi, you. Can you hear me? I can totally hear you. Yes. <laughs> It reminds me of a cell phone commercial. Yes, I can hear you. We're going. We're doing it. pretty well there for a while. I don't know what happened. I can totally hear you. Um, but yeah, it looks like you're going to have to reconnect. Or maybe that's it for Michael Schur for this week. Yeah, he had um, a little earlier out time. So maybe, yeah, uh... maybe that was it. The the uh, the tech problems wrapped it up. He is always out talking to uh, to Trump supporters. Uh, <laughs> trying to you know go to these rallies and get a slice of what people are saying it's really eye opening. Michael Shore, you can see. We, on- I think we could we could let's try it one more time and see if we could like wrap okay. up the segment. I was going to say you can see Michael Shore's reports on TYT, but let's bring him back in and uh, and see if we can't reconnect with him. Oh well, maybe maybe I just uh, it. I'm getting a spinning circle. I don't know. Yeah. Mm, it's not looking good for for Michael Shore, but I really do appreciate him being with us. Every week, the conversation is always great. He's so knowledgeable and so wonderful. But let's talk about that, uh, you and I. Do you think that President Biden would pardon his own son? I don't know if that would be something that's history uh, record setting or, or precedent setting. But would you use the power that you have to better the life of your child? Or because of the the outrage and pushback is it something that's not politically done i mean it'll be a tough move because Mm -hmm. i think the we know the one side has been making this a huge deal and and in by turn like we we, we're talking about him a lot (laughs) yeah and then the nepotism part well is it nepotism or is it 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 wouldn't really even matter either it's just he's the you could he has the power why not I mean, I think Trump would. I don't have a question about that. I, I do have a question about whether Biden would. Randy, yeah, right? Not, I, like, like, yeah, Randy, like the optics would be terrible, be, especially mm-hmm. because of he's in the news and their yep. tax returns. And I mean, there, there's some major uh, implications here for him. Randy writing, I think it would be politically unwise for Joe Biden to pardon Hunter. The optics of that would be terrible. But 
what if he did it, Randy, at the end of a of his term? He doesn't have anything to prove to anybody else anymore, and so he did it, and or would do it, and that would be that. I I don't know. Um, Dillette says I don't think that President Biden would pardon Hunter. Mm -mm. David says smells too much like nepotism to me. Uh, yeah, Lori thinking like I'm thinking at the end of his terms, he doesn't have to run again. Might as well. You have the power. You know why not do it, right? Uh, Doug saying, of course, President Biden would pardon his son if it came down to that. Wouldn't you? I don't know if my, if my son did something wrong and I pardoned him for it, it would be like telling the world that because I happen to have the power, my child shouldn't pay the price for what they're doing wrong. And if you keep rescuing your kids every time they do something like that, or every time they make a mistake, then they never get it. However, if you agree that Hunter Biden is facing more consequences than anybody else would simply because of who his father is, then maybe a father would feel responsible and pardon. I don't know. Um, Champagne Wishes says Clinton pardoned his brother. Mm -hmm. Ren writing, it seems like a conflict of interest to be able to pardon a family member and definitely shouldn't be able to pardon oneself. <laughs> that makes way too much sense, Ren. Absolutely. Uh, Egolf writing, he would pardon a hunter and then retire and Kamala would become the first male, female president. Perhaps? I don't know. It's an interesting scenario you paint. Angel in the Bay Area says, pretty sure part of the original plea deal was that Hunter could not be pardoned by his father. Hmm, I did not realize. Uh, and, oh, look at Cindy popping in with a $5 contribution to the show here. Love Friday's Fabulous Florida and Michael Shore. I do, too. So thank you, Cindy, for the $5 uh, contribution to the thank show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Julie says, I don't think I could not pardon my babies. Like, how do you have that power but not help? I hear you. I hear you. Um Michael's I mean, saying, when you're on a scale of being the president of yeah. the United States and anything you do is under a microscope. Of course. It's, a, it's, it's huge. It's like a really bad yeah. optics. I did see this come through earlier as well. The Lady Beatrice with a $5 contribution to the show. I really appreciate it. She writes, how much do you want to bet that with the whole Ukraine invasion, uh, Putin will lose the election? So I don't think the elections are legit. My opinion is that no matter who people vote for, Putin wins. Putin wins if Putin runs because it's, it's the fix is in. Uh, this is not America. Things are different there. And so I don't, um, I don't think Putin ever allows a situation where he doesn't win an election is, is kind of how I feel about that. Um, but I hear what you're saying. Absolutely. Interesting thought, though, about uh, pardoning and if uh, if a conviction happens or a plea deal is taken, whether or not the the president would step in in that situation. Yes, Angel in the Bay Area, smash it, smash it like you mean it. Um, thank you smash for doing that. With your, iron, smash, rod. With your iron, iron rod, we appreciate that. All right, let's go on to some other stories, because in just a few moments, we will have Michael Snyder, the culture blaster, hopping in to talk about some movies. Uh, but there are a couple stories that I saw today that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, one of them about this crazy, the conspiracies, always something, and it's always something so weird, out of left field that you don't even see coming. And I found this story about Stephen Miller. Remember him? He's just um, awful, repugnant, like distasteful. And every time I saw him on one of the news talk shows, you kind of get a sour feeling in your uh, stomach. Well, he's back at it. Stephen Miller is bashing Taylor Swift as not organic. And I saw that headline and I thought, what does that mean, not organic? Do you mean like she's AI? She's not a real human being? No. He is saying that her popularity is not authentic or genuine. That somehow she's a creation. 
Mm. Senior advisor and uh, controversial, we could what? say, Im- immigration architect to former President Trump, Stephen Miller, is now facing some criticism for his complaint that Taylor Swift's popularity is not organic after she was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. So that's where this is coming from. His comment is implying that he thinks her popularity is somehow artificially hyped up and may be another one of his fantasy conspiracy theories. He posted on X and Swifties got mad. They say uh, Democrats and anti-Trump Republicans coming together to push back against Miller's attack on Taylor Swift because he thinks that she is somehow, I don't know, there's some type of Taylor Swift conspiracy is going to be the next thing. <sighs> really? What else? What next? There's a, a basement and a place that doesn't have a basement. And people are doing things in a non-existent basement. And I mean, there's there's space lasers and there's, I don't know what, I don't know what you can come up with. But, you know, you have a big name like Taylor Swift, who gets a, an incredible honor for the things she's done this year and is named the Time Magazine Person of the Year. And whether you agree with that or not, or whether you're tired of hearing about Taylor Swift or not, you know, to to then use her name to come up with another one of these conspiracy theories, mm, uh, not a It's fan. like a headline grabber, just trying to say something crazy to get people's reactions. It's a... Uh... Yeah, I'm not a fan of that at all. Here's a Bay Area story I wanted to cover as well. The headline in SF Gate reads, this Bay Area man was arrested three times in four days amid an alleged crime spree. Let's just say, let's just stop there. He's arrested three times in four days. This is why police officers are frustrated and leaving their jobs. They are arresting the same people for the same stuff over and over and over again. Why is this person allowed out of jail to then do more harm? This 30-year-old man was most recently arrested on Wednesday for allegedly burglarizing a Castro Valley house. The resident called police when their security system notified them of the burglary. He fled from the scene before uh, the homeowner came back, but apparently uh, returned to the home and then was arrested on suspicion of burglary and possession of unlawful drugs. Uh, Police saying he had a controlled substance and the equipment to use it as well. Just two days before that, this man, suspected of burglary, was arrested on suspicion of stealing from a local gas station. And then the first arrest on Saturday, he was taken into custody for possession of drugs as he was approached for allegedly trying to steal packages from a house. So here we have a porch pirate. He was booked into Santa Rita jail on Wednesday afternoon. Now he's got a $55,000 bail. But... As of today or yesterday, he was cited and released from jail and given a notice to appear in court for the first and second arrests. He's today uh, appearing for the burglary. Are I think we... he likes stealing, Kim. I, I think, think so, um, too. Yeah. But we're spinning our wheels. We're doing this. We're allowing this person to get out and then burglarize and steal over and over and over again. Why when you're, I mean, three arrests in one week? The guy should have been in jail. Those second two crimes should never have been allowed to happen. That's what yeah, I, I don't know. It's, There's uh... never been anything like this. <laughs> it's it's really frustrating. And that, I think you hear a story like that, and it's that's why you're frustrated with you know, law enforcement, not police per se, but with what's happening with prosecution of these cases and sentences being handed down and how it seems like crimes, you know, don't really matter anymore. And our rights as uh, as people who are getting stolen from are at the bottom of the priority list. And it's really frustrating. All right. Well, let's move from that to happier, happier times, because we have the culture blaster, Michael Snyder, who is arriving to talk movies and TV and sports with a big Niners game on the way in this weekend. And so let's welcome Michael Snyder to the mix. He comes and goes on a rainbow. That's right. It is Michael Snyder, everybody. How are you, Michael Snyder? 
I am good, Tim, and happy Hanukkah to everybody, or happy Hanukkah. I always feel like I'm clearing my throat when I have that greeting at the uh, at the four. Uh, but, you know, I, I hope people are out there uh, stuffing themselves with latkes and uh, lighting the candles and uh, yeah. exchanging presents and enjoying the miracle of the uh, Maccabees. And the, and the I don't want to get into the details of the Festival of Lights. I just want to wish people a, a happy Hanukkah and, and kind of leave it at that. Happy Hanukkah to you, too. Yeah, I hope it's a good celebration. Yeah. So what do we have on tap for the movies this weekend? We we have some good stuff here. I mean, some uh, interesting films. Again, we are heading uh, into awards season, which means Mm -hmm. uh, quality movies with quality performers. And some of them are memorable. Some of them are disappointing. We also have some foreign fare that, uh, you know, is... Um, fun in in this case uh, and a couple of animated things for the the entire family so shall we begin let's begin i'm i'm definitely interested in the animated things but let's start wherever you want to start okay well a stunning in every sense of the word poor things is the latest idiosyncratic offering from the maverick greek-born director yorgos lanthimos Uh, whose previous English-language movies include the brilliantly disturbing thriller The Killing of the Sacred Deer and the award-winning dark comedy of Court Intrigue, The Favorite, which uh, boasted the acting triple threat of Rachel Weisz, Olivia Colman, and Emma Stone at their best. Now, Lanthimos has reteamed with Emma Stone in another tasty piece of Oscar bait uh, that reimagines the tale of Frankenstein, as an unhinged social satire mixing body horror, sexual politics, feminist Mm. manifesto, and a candide-like coming-of-age story. Uh, It's based on the 1992 novel of the same name by Scotland's Alistair Gray, Uh, but Poor Things takes us to Britain in the late 1800s, you know, the Victorian era. Sure. And uh, there there and then, uh, Dr. Baxter, a deformed genius who is a little on the mad scientist side, resurrects a dead young woman named Bella, uh, brought to life, so to speak, in magnificent fashion by Emma Stone. So the reborn and initially infantile Bella has to learn or relearn what it means to be human from scratch Uh, And with the guidance of the domineering Dr. Baxter, played by Willem Dafoe in a perfect stroke of casting. Um, uh, But Bella rebels, her autonomy and willpower strengthens and her capabilities and desires grow. In fact, she escapes Dr. Baxter's lab and home with the encouragement uh, and assistance of a conniving and voracious lawyer named Duncan. And this character gives Mark Ruffalo a showcase for his own versatile acting skills. Uh, The more Bella travels and the more people she encounters, the more she hungers to experience and learn, and the more Dr. Baxter and Duncan want to control her. Uh, Christopher Abbott and Margaret Qualley, who were so good in last year's fantastic Battle of the Sexes two-hander sanctuary, are also on board here and quite good in smaller supporting roles. Screenwriter Tony McNamara's script is ambitious and kind of picaresque. And with Mm -hmm. the aid of spectacular cinematography, digital magic, beautiful art direction, and exquisite costuming, Lanthimos and his players conjure up a remarkable world that revolves around Stone's protean ever-evolving performance uh, poor things isn't as startling as the killing of the, uh, a sacred deer or as brutally tragic comic as the favorite uh but closer to the latter and i actually found it a little smug here and there but all told it's amazing uh it, i mean it's another weird wild trip from lanthimos that's worth taking and stone kills it um uh, throughout and for the record poor things was the prestigious uh golden lion winner at this year's venice film festival and like i suggested it's clearly poised to make noise this awards season it's in theaters it, it was uh, really an experience kim really because i i heard it was kind of a weird movie and i wonder if sometimes those movies that you know at the end of it you look at each other and go that was really weird if those movies really resonate with people or if it's more of an artsy film that you kind of have to put your mind in a different place before you walk into it it's fun and it's funny it's not just you know weird uh, mm-hmm. And it and Stone is really a wonder to watch uh, as she goes through her paces 
I, you know, I was, you know, I go, I go in there as a fan of Lanthimos's work mm -hmm. and I just, you know, took to it again. I probably like uh, the killing of the sacred deer and the favorite a little more, but right. I still thought that it was pretty, pretty cool. Well, the poster is really interesting looking. You know, I could look at all the details on this for a while. It's kind of an, a neat piece of art. Uh, it's uh, pretty reflective of the movie as well. Yeah. All right, okay, let's so go on to the next one. What do we got? Something a little more down to earth. As a mm -hmm. major fan of author Elmore Leonard's hard-boiled but wry novels and some of the movies and TV shows based on those books like Out of Sight and... Uh, you know, uh, there have been a whole a slew of them, uh, all, you know, all of which I kind of dig. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm kind of the target demo for Fast Charlie, which is not okay. an Elmore Leonard adaptation, but um, it's kind of in that realm. It stars Pierce Brosnan uh, in a very assured turn as the title character. I it's, really like uh, him. <laughs> I, he's I, really good in this, Kim. And it's a little unexpected um, considering who he plays. It's, it's a yeah. very tight, engaging and slyly amusing crime thriller about Charlie Swift, thus the title Fast Charlie, mm -hmm. uh, played by Brosnan. And he is an aging Southern fixer whose most recent assignment, The Killing of a Low-Level Gangster, takes him from Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, to Louisiana, and eventually to New Orleans in Louisiana. And this may be Charlie's last hurrah, uh, because the victim's corpse is headless due to oh. circumstances. Yikes. Charlie needs the help of the dead man's ex-wife, Marcy, who... Um, strangely enough, is a taxidermist. Anyway, he needs Marcy to confirm the kill, you know, by looking at markers on the rest of the body and saying, oh, yeah, this is my former husband, that piece of crap. Uh, but this is to satisfy the New Orleans mob boss who ordered the hit. And that guy is a piece of work. But there are other forces in play here, including that mob boss that, uh, that are going to endanger Charlie and his retired mentor, Stan, and also put Marcy in peril, despite her having left the scene behind some time ago. And of course, you know, Charlie's going to get a little sweet on Marcy. Uh, and uh, Brosnan is cool as the proverbial cucumber here. And Marina Baccarin uh, of the cult TV series Firefly and the Deadpool movies. And, and one of my favorite actresses, by the way, is as appealing as she ever is uh, in the role of Marcy. And James Caan, that's right, James Caan still has the goods as Stan in what was his final on-screen performance. Oh, wow. So this yeah. is, fa in Fast Charlie, this is his last movie? I believe so, yeah. Um, and actually, this is so strange. This movie comes from the able veteran Australian director, Philip Noyce. This guy directed Patriot Games, Rabbit Proof Fence, Dead Calm, which is the movie that introduced Nicole Kidman to American audiences, uh, an Australian film. He directed The Quiet American, which I absolutely loved, and Clear and Present Danger. They're among his damn fine films. And yet Fast Charlie uh, isn't getting any kind of push or buzz. It's coming out today in theaters and available via the usual streaming services. And it was in my sweet spot. I don't care whether they made a fuss about it or okay. not. It's not a big deal it's not going to change uh the world or or have any major uh impact on cinematic history but right. man i enjoyed it and most lovers of this okay. genre yeah they're probably going to dig it as much as i did would you call it like a thriller kind of genre or what genre would you put it under it's a, it's a thriller a guy okay. uh, finds himself in untenable circumstances and has to somehow fight his way out and while doing yeah. so you know save uh, his leading lady which never hurts yeah. that's always kind of a fun thing you can't go wrong with that that formula but it works so that's good all right i'm putting it on my my list my snyder list of good stuff it's what else fun. is what else is happening what you got Okay, well, believe it or not, there is yeah. a new movie version of Alexandra Dumas' immortal swashbuckling novel, The Three Musketeers, about the bravest, most accomplished members of the King's Guard in 17th century France, Porthos, Arthos, Aramis, and their new recruit, D'Artagnan. You know, uh, all for one and one for all, that whole deal. Hasn't um, this been done too many times? Are we? Do we need another Three Musketeers movie? 
this is my thought going into it. Guess mm-hmm. what? It was good. Uh, and really? in fact, it comes from the country where the book was written mm-hmm. and where the action goes down in these uh, 1620s when Louis the Thirteenth ruled as king with the conniving Cardinal Richelieu as his chief advisor. And Richelieu, of course, does not like the Musketeers, and the Musketeers don't like him, and everybody's plotting against everybody else, and the Cardinal has a femme fatale in the middle of things to do his bidding, Milady de Winter. And um, it's, it's still great. It holds up. Uh, it, this is entitled The Three Musketeers, Part One, D'Artagnan. And mm-hmm. it's all about D'Artagnan coming from the countryside and uh, showing up to be a recruit. He feels he's born to be a musketeer and he, he wants to train with them and become part of their merry band. Uh, and the movie is directed in swaggering high style by Martin Bourboulon. And it's the first of a two movie tandem, uh, both of which, by the way, are already released in France and now coming out here in the States. Uh, so um, D'Artagnan is part one. Milady will be part two. And I'm not sure of the release date on it, but this is a blast. I mean, oh. it looks beautiful and it doesn't hurt that the cast features some of the biggest stars in French cinema, some of whom are known worldwide. Vincent Cassel is Athos. Romain Dory is Aramis. Um, the uh, young pretty boy uh, of French cinema, uh, Louis Garel, plays Louis uh, the Thirteenth, And uh, Ava Green is Milady. I mean, you loved her as James Bond's uh, yeah. love interest in Casino Royale. She's been in so many things. And bringing a woman of this uh, charisma and talent to the central role of Milady, it doesn't hurt the movie one bit. And oh, also, not not to, to um, ignore her, Vicky Cripps, the wonderful German actress, uh, plays Anne d'Autriche, who's also an important figure in the film. Uh, I, you know, I, I went in the same way you're saying, do we need another Three Musketeers movie? Yeah. I went in going, come on. And boy, it's... You it's enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. The cinematography is pretty wonderful. If you like this kind of stuff, again, um, you know, don't be put off by the fact it's yet another interpretation of the Duma novel, because, Mm. you know, I uh, I didn't realize this was the Three Musketeers we needed. Doug writes, Three Musketeers can't be overdone. Now, I heard you mention that there was a French actor, but this is is not a subtitle movie. This is in English, right? No, no, it's subtitled. So I'm sorry. You will need to read, you know. (laughs) There is some work involved, but worth it, you say. Yes, indeed. Uh, The next movie I'm going to mention, by the way, uh, is an animated beauty. And it's a movie that you can see in Japanese with subtitles. That's the native language of the filmmaker and uh, the movie's initial version. But there will be an American dub as well for, you know, the lazier amongst us. So um, I'm sorry, I don't mean Mm -hmm. to put people down for that, but, you know. I, I'm a real stickler. I love hearing the original uh, acting, uh, yeah. the voices in this case. But um, in his long and illustrious career, the legendary Japanese animator Hayao Miyazaki has brought us the glorious Academy Award winning movie Spirited Away, which is in my top 10 of uh, animated films of all time. It, if mm. you haven't seen it, um, audience, peoples, and if you haven't seen it with your family, Kim, Spirited Away is just absolutely wonderful i haven't um, seen it so i'll put it i'll put that one on the list as well it's it, it's so good uh, he also did howl's <laughs> moving castle princess mononoke kiki's delivery service my neighbor totoro uh the guy is like a a one-man industry in france although obvious uh, excuse me in japan although obviously you know he has uh the studio ghibli behind him um making these things Uh, But they're all these cartoon wonders. um, And he was thought to be retiring. He's not a young man. Uh, But if his his latest movie, uh, The Boy and the Heron, is any indication, he just can't stop making masterful feature films, nor should he. Um, This is set in Japan during the early days of World War II. uh, And The Boy and the Heron is purportedly semi-autobiographical. So I guess Miyazaki has drawn on some of his experiences as a child, Uh, regardless of whether or not it reflects actual circumstances of Miyazaki's childhood. It's a thoroughly gorgeous and otherworldly extravaganza about the odyssey of a kid named Mahito 
whose mother passed away at some time prior to the events of the movie. Uh, and in the aftermath of that loss, Mahito's father, a factory head who appears to be making machine or aircraft parts for Japan's war effort, mm -hmm, has mm -hmm. taken the boy to the countryside for safety. And there Mahito is to live with a group of elderly women and his young and beautiful aunt. That would be his mother's sister, who may also be in a developing relationship with Mahito's father. You know, all in the uh -oh. family, I guess. I don't no, know. No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, the, the, one sister dies, the other one takes her place. Uh, it's an old story. Anyway, yeah. right when Mahito settles in, a heron, one of those big, long-legged, long-winged birds with a, yeah. with a gigantic beak, uh, somehow appears outside the house and takes a strange interest in the boy. And of course, since this is a Miyazaki movie, the heron is more than it seems, and it leads Mahito to a nearby ruin that happens to be a portal to a fantastic alternative universe of bizarre creatures and heroic doppelgangers where uh, Mahito hopes to somehow find his late mother. He in insists that he's going to find her in some capacity in this uh, alternate place. Um, so once he's there, of course, things go totally Oz, as in Wizard of Oz, and the boy, accompanied by the transformed heron and other newfound companions, has to somehow find a way back to his new home in the normal world. And if that reminds anyone of Spirited Away, uh, which, to be fair, has a modern setting, so be it, Miyazaki has often placed everyday characters, uh, usually youngsters, in extraordinary situations and challenged them to learn and mature in order to return to the real world. Mahito's journey is like that, only with wartime Japan as the backdrop for the adventure. And it's a typically dazzling piece of work that reconfirms Miyazaki's status as a titan of animated storytelling. Uh, the Boy and the Heron is in theaters this weekend, and I'm sure we'll play well at home uh, when that option becomes available to people. Wow. Okay, cool. And would you say it's good for little kids or just older kids or... I you know I don't know how um, uneasy kids get with you know monstrous visages. It, there's a lot of excitement. Okay. Um, you know I wouldn't show it to a five year old, but you know Got a ten year old, it. yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. But that's not the only animated movie you're talking about today, right? Wow, you're like a seer. You're like a Cassandra somehow. Somehow it happens. Okay, so with an art style and character designs that look if they were, uh, as if they were more influenced by the surreal illustrator Ronald Searle, the cartoonist Gerald Scarf, or the gonzo caricaturist Ralph Steadman, than the usual DC Comics house style, Merry Little Batman is a fun and family-friendly Christmas-themed movie about the relationship between Bruce Wayne the Batman himself, and his nine-year-old son, Damien, who is a hyperactive kid determined to follow in his father's footsteps and become a crusading superhero. Uh, of course, uh, Bat Dad and the wizened Alfred, the Wayne family butler, think that Damien is far too young to go up against the supervillains of Gotham City yet. Uh, but circumstances leave Damien home alone. Yeah, the Macaulay Culkin reference is deliberate on Christmas Eve. And with mm -hmm. Batman on an assignment, there's no one around to save the holiday from the Dark Knight's rogues gallery. No one but Damien, who, by the way, is slightly older in the comic books, where he's the latest, uh, snarkiest and deadliest of Batman's various Robins. In the comics, Batman actually has a flesh and blood son. I don't know if you knew that, Kim. No. Anyway, by the way, uh, <laughs> Damien is the progeny of Bruce Wayne and the daughter of one of his greatest villains, uh, Rash al Ghul, uh, Talia oh, al Ghul. And so, means, of course, that means he's a he's a good guy, but he struggles with the heart of darkness. Exactly. He was mm -hmm. trained by the League of Assassins in the uh, in the comic books. But this uh, Damien in the movie is more like a kid, just a kid, albeit one with a certain set of skills, as Liam Neeson would say. Um, 
anyway, in Murray Little Batman, this pint-sized whirlwind dons a, a malleable version of the bat suit and does battle with particularly flamboyant takes on the Joker, the Penguin, Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy, and so on to save the holiday. Uh, this is directed by Mike Roth with Verve and Whimsy, and it features Luke Wilson as the voice of Bruce Batman Wayne, mm-hmm. uh, James Cromwell, the distinguished uh, older actor as the voice of Alfred, David Hornsby as the voice of the Joker, and Jonas Kibreb as the voice of Damien. Murray Little Batman isn't a groundbreaker. It's just lively, funny, chaotic, and ultimately a little on the warm-hearted side, uh, and it should produce uh, a little bit of joy around the holidays and provide fanboys and fangirls of all ages some super-powered Yuletide cheer and... It's available on Amazon Prime Video right now. Mm, That's what Eric was asking. He said, I hadn't heard of this one. Is it streaming? So Amazon Prime, huh? It is. It's, okay. it's again, it's not going to change the world. This is not Miyazaki-level animation, but this is, you know, it's it's a good time. And it's uh, something where you can gather with the kids and, uh, and kick back and, and enjoy it. Okay. Great suggestion. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, you know, um, we watch a lot of television here mm-hmm. at um, Shea Culture Blast, and uh, <laughs> I have been enamored. I mean, totally uh, crazy about a series on Apple TV called Slow Horses, uh, which is yes. basically it, it, it's um, a, a kind of an espionage thing based on the books of Mick Heron. And, um, you know, the the bare bones of this are terrific there are people that just don't fit in at mi5 the british equivalent of the fbi and so the directors send them to an annex a rundown uh building in london and they're, they're kind of trying to hide these misfits and incompetence in their minds and the place is called slaw house and they call the uh, people that have been banished there uh, the slow horses, you know, the horses. Mm-hmm. And um, Gary Oldman plays Jackson Lamb, uh, who is the leader of this group of, of misfits at uh, Slow House. And he um, is kind of disgusting. He's, you know, kind of grimy. He's short tempered. He's mean spirited. He, he cuts down everybody. Uh, in his path, he mistreats his uh, underlings. Sounds and rather I, I, rather Trump esque. Well, but he's really <laughs> incredibly good at what he does. Oh. He just is incredibly unlikable. Mm. And um, it, it, this is the third of the three seasons so far, and it's based on the book "Real Tigers" by Mick Heron. And in this instance. The threat to uh, England and to the MI5 and to, I guess, the population comes from within. I'm not telling tales to reveal that. Uh, And I I have to uh, also say that it's halfway done. It's usually only a a six episode investment, which is kind of great uh, in terms of time and stuff. And Oldman is back uh, and in his glory here as Jackson Lamb. I mean, the guy just doesn't care. And um, his underlings include uh, a disgraced agent named River Cartwright, uh, played by Jack Loden. And Loden is really wonderful. And boy, he takes a beating in series three. It's all I'll say about that. Um, and uh, their superiors uh, at the home office of MI5 include uh, Kristen Scott Thomas, wonderful actress, as Diana Taverner. And as her superior officer, uh, the great uh, Sophie Okonedo. And there are wonderful supporting players, um, most of whom play the uh, the outcasts at Slow House. And, um, you know, if you get a chance, if you like this kind of thing, um, it, it's not so much like John le Carre. It's not Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. It's a lot funnier and a little more twisted up. But it is basically about the inner workings of, uh, of an intelligence bureau. And I thought it was wonderful. Well, uh, now it continues it's, to be great. It's been recommended to me twice now, so I think I'm going to have to check it out. Uh, I did get a comment. Someone uh, wants to know if Gary Oldman has a Cockney accent in this one. 
he has an accent, but I don't know if it's going to be anything uh, that um, specific. Uh, by the way, um, River's father is uh, played by the wonderful uh, Jonathan Price, who was the star of the great film mm-hmm. Brazil by um, Terry Gilliam and is a, a you know esteemed British actor. Yeah. Um, I mean, they didn't stint on this thing, and there are a lot of um, performers that I don't I don't know who they are, yeah. you know, but they're just wonderful for the role. And yeah. you're you're rooting for and against the various principles as you're watching this thing. It's it's I you know I couldn't recommend it um, higher. Cool. I've been watching the latest installment of The Crown. So that's where where I am in, in TV watching. But I think Slow Horses will have to be my next my I next one. would love to hear what you think about it. And uh, I, again, I continue to uh, watch Monarch Legacy of Monsters, which uh, mm-hmm. we discussed last week, and The Gilded Age on HBO. And, um, you know, it, there's so much prestige television. I am absolutely um, on... Uh, Tenterhooks. I'm excited because Reacher is coming back for a second season about the uh, hulking uh, good guy, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Jack Reacher, played by Alan Richson. And uh, it's uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, um, an Amazon movie TV series thingy and um, based on a series of novels. And again, uh, first rate work. Um, yeah. by the producers, directors, and writers who have adapted the Reacher novels. Um, and Alan Richson, it, for such a big hulk of a man, he certainly has, you know, the charisma and the skills. Um, you know, I remember when Clint Eastwood played the man with no name in those spaghetti westerns? Yeah. He's sort of taciturn and square-jawed. You get a little of that from Alan Richson, only there's a little more uh, wit and charm behind his character than, you know, than Clint ever gave us. I don't know if you've seen this, but we're getting a question for you from Julie. She says, uh, Michael, your thoughts on Top Boy. We loved it. Well, I haven't seen it, so I should really seek it out at your recommendation, Julie. This is one of those rare times when we have a little breathing room to respond mm-hmm. to some of the uh, um, you know, uh, chat room uh, habitues. So yeah. uh, by all means... Um, you know, I uh, yeah, ask away. If we have a couple more minutes, I think. Top boy, and then Lori writes Julia on HBO is excellent. Oh, is uh, again? You mean is is that something about Julia uh, Child? Or... I would assume so, but I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Uh, I think Lori has to clarify for us. Yeah. So let's talk a little sports, and I also want to ask you what your favorite Christmas movie is of all time. So if you have one. Okay, well, um, let's start with that because it is the holidays. And um, I would probably, but this is so embarrassing. uh, It's a Wonderful Life is so. That's a good one. Yeah. Inescapably uh, great. And to tell you that it invariably elicits a little bit of moisture uh, from the eye region every time I watch it. But, you know, uh, it's hard to, uh, to hate on a Christmas story. Um, there are versions of uh, a Christmas Carol out there. You know, the Alistair Sims version, of course, is right. first rate. I'm trying to think, you know, you have me a little on the spot because I'm not quite in Christmas mode yet. But, OK, um, you know, the, the, the lights are uh, uh, bedecked here in the neighborhood. And, uh, yeah. you know, we're getting the uh, the, the smell of, uh, of firewood and, uh, you know, the uh, I can almost taste the eggnog. Uh, That's well, right. Hollywood. Almost. I have to say mine would be Elf. Elf is charming. Yeah, um, I just I, really I'm, like it. I'm very fond of it. You know what? I yeah. Okay, now now that I've I had a few moments to reflect, Bad Santa is my favorite. Oh, no, movie. that can't be right. That can't it's be right. It's true. It's no. the anti-wonderful life. It's I don't. Ex- I don't accept that answer. I reject. Billy, Billy Bob Thornton is no. absolutely fantastic in Bad 100% Santa. 100% no, no, no. no. Kim, we have a couple more weeks before (laughs) Christmas. We'll get to more Christmas movies when they come to mind. But I know you uh, brought up sports. And Mm -hmm. man, oh, man, the 49ers delivered in a big way on Sunday and uh, shocked the world. And yet, uh, yet, 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 absolutely, uh, nationwide, uh, people continue to doubt Brock Purdy. Keep on doubting him, people. Um, If you never saw you know a football game in your life and you watched yeah. Brock Purdy perform behind our purportedly 
second rate offensive line with the, the exception of Trent Williams, you'd go, this guy must be the best quarterback in history. But yeah. the fact that he was uh, drafted last and uh, the prognosticators all got it wrong and they keep thinking noodle arm and dink and dunk, even when the statistics don't say that he's a, a quarterback like that, you know, that that completely colors the uh, the national narrative and he does not fit their narrative. So they continue to uh, wait for him to, to slip up. And meanwhile, if you have never had the opportunity, go to Twitter and type in 49 hours. And it's the encapsulate uh, encapsulation of uh, each week's game beforehand and afterwards. And uh, this week's is an absolute treat. Uh, there are so many um, charismatic and talented players on the 49ers right now that it's a joy to be a fan. Uh, and, you know, Freddie Warner, uh, obviously, um, you know, George Kittle, um, uh, Christian McCaffrey, Bosa, um, you know, it's it's a joy. Debo Samuel is like, mm -hmm. you know, he's like a, the living embodiment of, of fireworks. It's just wonderful to watch him play. And their affection for one another is real and it may propel them into the big game. Well, the, as I was told earlier, it's bird hunting season. So a lot of people watching now and excited that the 49ers are doing so well. Uh, they go up against their rivals in the N NFC West, uh, the Seahawks on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping for a victory for the 49ers. Awesome. Michael Snyder, thank you for all the great information. I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat saying, ah, oh, that sounds like a great movie. I'm going to go see it. So you're giving a lot of people some great ideas today. Thanks for all the information and for hanging out and chatting a bit as well. I will see you next Friday, my friend. Indeed. And Mark, uh, have a blast. You and Courtney, wherever you are right now. They were set last. I talked to them last night. They were on a boat headed toward Cabo. Boy, uh, uh, that's a tough life to live, isn't it? <laughs> that's what I said. And the Rob, I feel really sorry for you, pal. Exactly. All right, have a great, have a great weekend, Bye. Kim. Bye. Uh, it comes out. and goes on a rainbow. Bye, Michael Snyder. Go Niners. All right. It is uh, time to end the Mark Thompson show. But before we do, I do want to thank Pinky, dollar a day Pinky, who stepped up uh, with another dollar. Thank you for supporting the show. So grateful to all of you and all the ways you support the show for hanging out with me. Of course, Mark gone now for <sighs> through the new year. So we'll be hanging out together a bit, but we've got a lot of great things. I'm so excited. I don't know if you know who Jake Shimabakuro is. He's this world-renowned ukulele artist, and I have him on tap for next week. Next week, what? we'll also play some... I know, I'm excited too. We'll play some interviews that uh, Mark Thompson has left behind. We'll start the music again. We'll re-rack it. We'll do it live. Uh, please join me on The After Party next on YouTube. The After Party Live with John Daly and myself happens uh, right after this show is over. Again, thank you for being here and thank you for all of your comments and the, the discussion in the chat. I will see you on Monday. Happy Hanukkah to those who celebrate it and have the very best weekend. Bye, Albert. What could this be? Let's look. Thank you.